Well, good morning. Ooh, those lights are bright. It's good to see everybody. Well, welcome to Walnut Hill. I would like to welcome everyone down in 180, and I'd also like to welcome everyone that's watching online. Happy Sunday and good morning. I have a few, more than a few announcements, so I'll try to get through them really quickly. Uh, members, we have an annual business meeting next Sunday. It's going to start at, oh boy, 6 p.m. I should know that. I'm the one that put it in the bulletin, 6 p.m. Um, this meeting is going to be in person only. We're going to have seating up here in the sanctuary, and then we're also going to have seating downstairs in 180 so we can spread out if needed. This is where we vote on our budget for the next ministry year, and it's also going to be a time when we um, look at some missions, some annual reports, and we have some new members to vote in too. So it should be a good time. All right, so on to Women's Summer Book Club. They've read three books this summer. Their last meeting is this Wednesday. It's going to be in the Fellowship Hall. It starts at 6.30, so um, hopefully that'll be a great time for them. Men, Wilderness Canoe Trip in Ely. There are still a few spots, so this has filled up kind of quick. Spacing is limited, but there are a few spots if anyone wants to sign up. I think we're cutting sign-ups off by the 20th. So if you're interested at all, if you have any questions, give Josh Wilkos a call or head over to the website and sign up. And then Celebration Sunday. It is happening. We are praying that it will be outside um, September 6th, 10 a.m. We'll give you more details as soon as we have them. And then my last announcement for the middle schoolers and the high schoolers, we are having pool parties. So Andy and Candace Kamala have opened up their pool and they are ready to welcome middle schoolers on Tuesday from three to five and high schoolers on Wednesday from six to nine. Any questions on that, um, get a hold of the church office or get a hold of Pastor Jesse. Thanks. Would you stand with me and let's open our service with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is for us to gather. We do recognize the responsibility of it. You've told us to do it. It's important to you that we make it a habit to gather together as the body of Christ. But Lord, we declare also it is a privilege. It is good for our spirits it's good for our souls lord it's it's good to be in the house of the lord it's good to be sharpened by brothers and sisters and and uh, to be awakened to spiritual realities through uh, an opening up of your word and lord i just pray that this service today would be no exception that this would be an opportunity for us to sing together for us to um, share fellowship and encouragement with one another and Lord, I pray that your son, Jesus Christ, might be central in all that is said and done today. All praise to him. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can go ahead and be seated. This is one of those things that Christians have been doing for over 2,000 years. But I think if you're a non-believer, you would look at a gathering like this and wonder what in the world are these people doing? What does it all mean? What does the blood of Christ mean to us? What does cleansing mean to us? What does giving your life to Christ mean to us? We don't get something for nothing. You know what our salvation cost Christ? It cost him his life and his lifeblood. Just as you receive Christ Jesus as your Lord, now continue to live in him. This is the word for the Baptist people who are being baptized. Continue to live in him. That is the key to life in our existence and really to joy in this world. And you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. Okay, that's who we answer to, the one who is over every power and authority and we live in him if that's not a blessing i don't know what is
Morning, church. You're awfully quiet out there. Hey, morning, Lucy. There's my girl. I'm going to teach you a new song. It's time to have another song that fits this season that we're going through and encourages us and helps us to think rightly through it. So today, I'm just going to sing the song for you, and I'm inviting you to meditate on the lyrics, and, uh, and we're going to sing this together next Sunday. But for today, why don't you just listen in? Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Thank you for being a faithful God to your people. Thank you that you are incredibly reliable and trustworthy and true to your word. Thank you for your faithfulness to this church and the ways that you've provided for our needs over the past several months. 
And Lord, we pray your blessing on today's offering. We desire to make you known to all that you bring here and to this community and to the world through our missionaries. So Lord, we pray that you would guide us in the use of all that's brought in today, that you could be made known more. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. I'm going to read the entire, can you handle an entire chapter of the Bible? It's narrative. I think we can do it. Acts chapter 3. We'll start right at the beginning. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate to the temple that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive nothing or to receive something from them. Um, but Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. Then all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astonished, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people. Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of us all. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brothers, I know you acted in ignorance and did also, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that this Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back, and your sins may, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his prophets long ago. Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him in whatever he tells you, and it shall be that every soul that does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. Well, we're back in the book of Acts. 
with a new stride, I hope. We're going to kind of dance our way through chapter 3 after we spent many weeks working through chapters 1 and 2 as if we were trying to push up Mount Everest or something to the charge of kind of a disproportionate treatment of the different chapters of Acts. I must plead guilty. We need to get moving. And we are encountering a wonderful and inspiring narrative passage here. So what we're going to do, um, this story really encompasses chapter, chapters 3 and 4. This week we'll take chapter 3, and next week we will take chapter 4. Well, the theme of the book we know of Acts is again identified by Jesus himself in chapter 1. After his atoning death, after his resurrection from the dead, as he's just about to ascend into heaven, he told his disciples their mission. They would be witnesses. Not witnesses of a crime, but witnesses of eternal life through Jesus Christ. They were going to be his witnesses here, there, and everywhere. They would take the good news to the entire world earth. But apparently it wasn't going to be easy. They weren't yet equipped for their mission. They needed the power of the Holy Spirit, which they received dramatically some days later at the festival of Pentecost. And here we are in chapter 3. And we encounter something as amazing as it is wonderful. Now, I'm not going to minimize this message isn't going to be all about the particular healing that took place uh, here in Acts chapter 3. I'm, I don't want to minimize that overwhelmingly wonderful experience of healing that takes place here. But it's set in the context of something equally wonderful. I consider this the grand opening, as it were, the inaugural event, the big reveal for the mission of empowered witnesses. They just received the Holy Spirit. And yeah, there was a little bit of testifying that took place in that event. But now they are set loose to begin their mission. The picture of radical life change giving birth to dynamic ministry is taking place here in Acts chapter 3. So I consider uh, this story to be a portrait of inspiring courage. It's an, a portrait of inspiring uh, courage. Have you ever heard of that word? Courage? Is it used much these days? It feels like it's in short supply. Uh, but lest you get too smug, the concept of being a courageous witness for Jesus is, e is in even shorter supply. I don't know if you remember Josh McDowell. Um, you don't hear as much about him these days, but I remember when I was in high school, he had this little thing that he would say, if you were charged with being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict? Oh, there'd be evidence, right, that you're a Christian, he'd say, but with the language that you use, the music that you listen to, oh, all the choices that you make, would there not be plenty of reason for reasonable doubt? But for the purpose of today, I would ask something similar, but a little di different. Um, would the charges stick? Would the DA take the case? Could the argument really be made that you are a courageous witness of Jesus Christ? Is the idea of being a courageous witness for Jesus something from the past? Or is it something that we're called to do today? Maybe asked another way, would the gospel have made it to the ends of the earth if it had started with you and with me? I think in these days of very strange winds that keep blowing, I think God is calling us to get back to the basics why are we here on earth? We're called to be courageous witnesses for Jesus. Well, for this morning, three things. 
First, I'm going to give you three encouragements for courageous, uh, three encouragements for courageous witnesses. Then I'm going to try to give you one challenge that those encouragements will lead into. And then uh, I've got one story to share at the end, another missionary story. Well, let's begin with three encouragements, shall we? From Acts chapter 3, the first one I'd say is to start seeing divine appointments. Start seeing divine appointments. Peter and John are, I don't know where James is, in the Gospels, it always seems like it's Peter, James, and John. But here it's Peter and John. They're heading to the temple for prayer. Okay, So they're making their way to their, their prayer meeting. Um, but that's just really the subtext for what's going to happen in this day. They are witnesses to the saving work of Jesus Christ. And as witnesses, that was their role every day day and every moment of every day. Well, what interactions are random, really, in the life of the believer? Here, Peter and John are headed, <clears throat> heading to pray. They're just overflowing with joy and desiring to pray out to the Lord at the temple. Meanwhile, there, there's a man here um, that resumes his humbling routine. Day after day, he's carried to the temple to essentially beg. It is his daily task. It's just another day at work for him. And in this moment, there is this seemingly random exchange um, of personalities. And this man asked for alms, and he receives more than he could have possibly asked for. And we re receive in this passage an incredible interaction. I like the, the use of the language here. Um, that, that Luke uses, and it's all a description of eyes, right? It's seeing something here. This man seeing Peter and John about to go to the temple, he asked to receive alms. So, uh, and Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John. So there's a lot of seeing going on. And then they say, look at us, and he fixed his attention on them. I love the, the use of the language of, of eyesight. They are fixated on one another and I think it's important um, here to remember the context of what's taking place here. But let's follow through with what, what's actually said. As they notice this man, as their eyes and attention are turned to him, this isn't a random event. Peter says, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up. And walk. Someday I want to do a series on the 10 most dramatic exchanges in the scriptures, and this one would likely make it. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took his right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles, ankles were made strong. I think it's important to notice the context, what's taking place here. I think when I read this passage in Acts, I can't help but to think of a bright, shiny day. It just seems like a, another day in downtown Mayberry, right? Everything is right. Everything is easy. And here this exchange takes place and all this joy comes out of it. But I think it's important to remember that this is still the same terrifying context that put Jesus on the cross, the same folks that just arrested Jesus are here. Momentum is in their favor. The same crowds that turned on Jesus are all around. The same crosses used to bear the Lord sit ready to be used again. The same terror that absolutely overwhelmed Peter just weeks before. It's still here. It's still in the air. But the disciples seem impervious to all that is around them. Timidity and insecurity and anxiety were displaced from their very reasonable place. They were men on a mission. And at any moment, some unsuspecting person 
might come into contact with them, and they might be given opportunity to witness to the living Christ. So eyesight, uh, eyes met there, and a connection was made. And the history of empowered witnessing was underway. Do you look around you and see opportunities amidst the seemingly random happenings of your life? Do you move around with a sense of who you are in this world? I'm, of course, not encouraging arrogance, but your primary identity is not color. It's not gender or age group or political affiliation or education or occupation or any other marginal designation. If you are a follower of Jesus, you are his witness. You are a witness for his goodness and his power in your life. And I think it's important for us to start seeing divine appointments. Start seeing and looking for interactions with people with whom you can share the good news of the salvation of Jesus Christ, God's power in your life. Start seeing divine appointments. Who just moved into your neighborhood? Why do you think they just moved into your neighborhood? Don't sit there for six years before you talk to your neighbors. Who are your kids' friends? Who are your coworkers? God turns seemingly hap happenstance associations into divine appointments if you will have the eyes to see. To see. Another encouragement for courageous witnesses, <clears throat> start believing in the power of God. It's hard to testify to something you don't actually believe in yourself. Maybe for some of you, that's a challenge in reading this passage. Here, an amazing, miraculous healing takes place. Maybe you say, yeah, maybe if I saw some of that in my day, right, then maybe I would believe in the power of God of God. Why doesn't God do that kind of stuff in our day? Well, he does, doesn't he? He does. I would say he does and he doesn't, right? He, he does it according to his own timing and his own will. You're not every day going to see something like this take place. Does God do miracles today? Absolutely. Now, remember, when God works through natural occurrences, when he works through natural law, we usually refer to that as his providence. He providentially works. God is working all the time. But there are times when God works outside of natural law, outside of natural occurrences. He does something supernatural, and that we call a miracle. Well, there are clusters of miracle when you read the Bible, right? I mean, creation, there's all sorts of miraculous taking place in the days of, of Moses. There's just kind of this spiking, the days of Elijah, the, the, the days of Jesus, the apostles. Those are some noteworthy, but there are miracles that take place all through the scriptures. And I think there are miracles that take place all through human history. Do you believe in the power of God? If you don't, you're never going to be a courageous witness. In fact, you don't need the Holy Spirit if you're not calling for the power of God to come into your lives. You don't need his power. You will be content with being a likable witness. You don't need to be an empowered witness. If there's no power of God, you can just be likable. Man, that neighbor of mine is a really nice guy. I sure like my neighbor. Is that what we're called to be here on this earth? Is that our witness? Has God worked powerfully in your life? This man wanted money. He received something better, right? He received physical health. But I think Jesus, I think Peter here is, is recognizing something even more significant. Money, material possessions, 
health is seen as better. But when he addresses the crowds, he doesn't say, hey, I've got God's power for you too. Name your ailment. What do you got? I've got a solution. The name of Jesus can provide for your physical healing too. You know what, Jesus, or what Peter went to right here? He went to the human heart. It went to another place. He said, you killed the author of life. Well, wait a minute. We wanted to hear more about this guy that got healed. Well, you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. And to this we are witnesses. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong. So he, he recognizes it's, it's faith here, right, in Jesus. It's faith in Jesus that has made this man well. And then he urges them to a higher healing, to something even better. You acted in ignorance, but what God foretold by the mouth of the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. You may be, you may be crucified, Jesus, but this maybe was part of God's plan. And what's his solution? Repent, therefore, and turn back. Turn from your sins, sins, that what would happen? That your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Have you turned from your sins? If you have repented from your sins, turn from them, you have received forgiveness before God. Your sins are blotted out and times of refreshing have taken place. That's what Peter's ultimate witness is here. He's showing that God can heal the human heart in healing the human legs. And here at this point, I think we should note that the biggest work God can do in your life isn't just to sustain your life for a little bit longer or to give you a little higher quality of life for the here and now. God desires to change your heart. He desires a freedom and a forgiveness that can take place from within that's even more significant than the absolute wonder of a skipping joyous man who has been lame from birth. Do you believe God changes the human heart? I mentioned to one of the guys a study this week that I might have another former inmate to send their way. And of course, that's met with a mix of emotions, right? I mean, how wonderful, and yet you kind of, you think, what adventure are you sending us our way this time, right? Or how many weeks is this guy going to uh, last before he disappears or falls off the wagon? I mean, that's just part of a reality of this type of ministry. And yet we believe in the power of God. And I look over at Nate Sorensen. Nate Sorensen doesn't have a mix of emotions. He's sitting there. He's absolutely locked in. The power of God in Nate's life for salvation means everything. The power of God for ongoing strength to be the man that he wants to be means everything. Nathan can't wait. He can't wait. I'm, I'm going to leave it up to God how this all pans out in the end. He can't wait to testify to the power of God in his life and encourage whoever I bring his way to know it's there for the taking for them too. God still works in our time. Start believing in the power of God. And then a third encouragement. Start using the name of Jesus. Start using the name of Jesus. Now I'm teasing out a little bit of next week's message. But this whole story kind of devolves or deconstructs down to the name that was used in this healing. Peter and John are going to testify, this was all about a certain name. You got a problem with this healing? Hey, th there's a name that had to be proclaimed. And I sometimes wonder, do we ever use his name? <laughs> do we ever mention the name of Jesus. I mean, when he heals them, he says, in the name. I got a name for you. You have greater needs than you even know. I got a name for you. The name is Jesus. This man apparently 
trusted in this name, and it caused his, his healing. And then when he starts preaching, he just can't help but to say, Jesus, 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 in his name. The faith in his name has made this man strong. It's the same name he's calling them to place their trust in. Repent and turn. Your sins may be blotted out. Times of refreshing may come. And that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus. Can I issue just a real brief little challenge for us this week? I'm feeling very convicted. Also feeling a lot of, we had an unusual amount of, I don't know if it's warfare. <laughs> we had a lot even just to get this service going. And if you're able to hear this service at home um, today, a lot <laughs> was gone through to get there, right, Sean? It was a challenging day. We're just like, what are we being attacked? I got two phone calls, or one was a phone call and one was somebody walking in this morning uh, to report two deaths that just took place. I got a third phone call, uh, challenges that were taking I don't usually get phone calls in the morning on, on Sundays when I'm doing my last-minute preparations. But I sometimes wonder, I wonder now, you know, is it this part of the message? I kind of felt like, man, I can't make this challenge. Can I live up to this challenge? Well, I'm going for it, all right? Here's my challenge. Every day this week, I want you to use the name of Jesus in a conversation. Every day this week, you have an interaction with someone. Pray that God would give you the eyes to see the opportunity and the courage in your heart to take it. You're walking outside. You're, we're doing all sorts of mulching, and you see a neighbor outside. Here's my opportunity. God, give me the ability and give me the opportunity for Jesus to come up. And I mean, you can bring it up. You, you might actually have to think about how in the world would I ever talk about Jesus? Give him credit for something in your life, and you might, you might actually find the opportunity to share the very gospel of Jesus Christ with someone. But I want you to use the name of Jesus in a conversation at least one time. So every, every day it starts out. You can't do two on Monday and count one of them for Tuesday, okay? You got to do one every day. And if you're in trouble and you're near the end of the day, um, I mean, I, I'm, I would say some of you guys are social media monsters. Okay, do it on social media. If, you're, if you get to the point in the day where you've, you've run out of opportunities, or at least write a, a card. If you get to the end of the day and you haven't done it, you get a right to someone, a loved one, and you need to write something in there and share a little bit about what Jesus has done for you or what you know he can do for them or what you're praying for them that Jesus might. I like talking about God. I say praise God all the time, right? I say praise God or may God bless you. But I want you to try to start using the name of Jesus. Jesus is the name by which this man placed his faith. And Jesus is the name by which Peter and John called them to a saving faith. Get used to Why is it so hard to say Jesus? I think that's a spiritual battle. How many are you going to do that this week? How many will accept that challenge? All right? You don't have to raise your Should we raise our hands? Let's do it. I just saw a bunch of hands go up. Don't, now, don't raise your If you need time to think about it, if you need time to think about it, say, I need, think, I need time to think about it. Raise your hand if you need time to think about it. I'm not even going to look. All right? Okay, this one here. That's fine. How many are you going to accept the challenge every day? And do your best. Every day this week, I'm going to mention the name of Jesus to someone. How many of you will enter that? All right. Let's give it a shot, okay? And then next week, we're going to have two weeks where the name of Jesus is all over the place. Let's, let's uh, see how we do. All right, let's finish with a little story of a courageous witness for Jesus Christ. You ever heard of David Brainerd? Wonderful Christian man. How many of you uh, have a child? Anybody here have a child that was born in 2018? A two-year-old? If you did, then David Brainerd was born 300 years earlier. 
He was born in 1718 in Haddam, uh, Connecticut. He was one of 10 children born to Christian parents, Dorothy and Hezekiah Brainerd. Isn't that a great name? I don't hear that one too often. Tragedy hit the Brainerd home when Hezekiah died when little David was just nine. Lost his dad at age nine. Miseries were compounded with the passing of Dorothy five years later, making David an orphan at the age of 14. By God's grace, help came uh, through an older sister who took him in and raised him to adulthood. An avid thinker and reader, really a brilliant mind, um, in early adulthood, though not truly converted by his own later testimony, he made it a practice to read through the Bible twice every year. Isn't that interesting? He wasn't even necessarily a believer, but he was going to read through the Bible twice every year. He struggled to love God and care about divine honor and glory. He fought the notion of original sin and his inability to please God on his own. So he knew all sorts of stuff about the Lord, but he just couldn't make that commitment to, to love and to trust him. Suddenly on the Lord's Day, July 12, 1739, at age 21, Brainerd recalled of this day, and this is what he said, unspeakable glory seemed to open to the, uh, to the view and apprehension of my soul. It was a new inward ap apprehension or view that I had of God, such as I never had before, nor anything I have at least remembered uh, remembrance of it. My soul rejoiced with joy unspeakable to see such a God, such a glorious, divine being. And I was inwardly pleased and satisfied that he should be God over all forever and ever. I felt myself in a new world. So he knew all about the Lord. But there finally came a point in his life where he loved the Lord, trusted the Lord, and wanted all of his life to be for the Lord. Two months later, he enrolled the nearby training school for Christian ministry, the School of Connecticut, now known as Yale. In his second year at school, he had to take a leave of absence due to a serious illness that included a little coughing up of blood. In those days, the spiritual enthusiasm of many students at Yale was causing quite a commotion. These were the stirrings of the first great awakening. But to the faculty of the school, such religious fervor seemed unnatural and excessive. Tensions escalated. The administration called out the kids for being spiritually supercharged, while the kids called out the teachers for being spiritually dead. Students began uh, being fined for failing to fall in line, and they even began some becoming expelled. Brainerd was among them, though being the top of his class. His expulsion was actually a devastating setback and seeming death sentence to his dreams of being a pastor. He could not legally obtain an appointment as a minister in Connecticut without a degree from Harvard, Yale, or one of the schools of Europe. After another period of disappointment and uncertainty, at the age of 25, Brainerd found the calling for his life. He devoted himself fully to missionary work among the Native Americans near what is today Nassau, New York. His work was marked by incredible devotion to God, humility before God, and a deep sense of calling to reach the unreached with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some wonderful quotes from David Brainerd. Let me forget the world and be swallowed up in the desire to glorify God. He just gave himself fully. Lord, let me make a difference for you that is utterly disproportionate to who I am, saying you're so worthy, and I'm, would you, would you allow someone so unworthy like me to do something wonderful for you? I like this one too. This morning about nine, I withdrew to the woods for prayer. I was in such anguish that when I rose from my knees, I felt extremely weak and overcome. I cared not how or where I lived or what hardship I went through so that I could but gain souls for Christ. So in his moments of dark misery, what kept him moving was a desire to gain souls for Christ. His sufferings and determination to push through them at 
the cost of his own health became legendary. Brainerd would surely be forgotten had he not uh, maintained a disciplined journal. He chronicled, chronicled wonderful, inspiring experiences, witnessing to the power of Jesus Christ to change lives. He started a school for Native American children and began translating the Psalms. Later, he was assigned to work with the Delaware Indians along the Delaware River. Uh, his final assignment uh, in his short career was at the Indian Church in New Jersey. He saw a congregation of more than 130 new believers take shape. He found fruitful ministry wherever he went. Over 3,000 miles traveled on horseback. That's how you got around in those days. Depression overtook him often. He journaled extensively about this. He recorded at least 22 oca specific occasions where he wished for death always battling the effects of isolation and hunger and that nagging cough. He eventually had to leave the mission field and try to recover. Having no mother or father, no wife or children, he providentially ended up at the home of his biographer, one of the most noteworthy pastors and brilliant theologians ever known, Jonathan Edwards of Northampton, Connecticut. Edwards had 10 daughters. One of them, 17-year-old Jerusha, developed a strong affection for the sickly Brainerd and ministered at his side to the very end. On October 9th, 1747, at the age of just 29, Brainerd went home to be with the Lord. 29. Buried next to him is Jerusha Edwards, who died four months later, having contracted tuberculosis in caring for Brainerd. Well, what do you do with a story like that? Is that a good story or is that a bad story? Did Jonathan Edwards begrudge the fact that he ever laid eyes on Brainerd? Why did I let that man in my home? He was sick. And now I have lost my daughter. No, for people back in those days, they understood dying is part of living. And it's God's business. Today, even Christians despise the idea of dying. Very few Christians have the zeal of a David Brainerd to ensure not that people don't die, but they are ready but that they are ready for the event when it most surely will come. Jonathan Edwards set aside other pressing labors to produce the biography of Brainerd's short life entitled An Account of the Life of the Late Reverend David Brainerd. John Wesley read it and said, let every preacher read carefully over the life of David Brainerd. This is before the modern missions movement. This was a man that was an absolute pioneer in this type of self-sacrificial missionary work. It's the most reprinted of all of Jonathan Edwards' masterful books. It has never been out of print, and it has been read by countless Christian leaders through many generations, including by William Carey, the founder of modern-day missions. Well, he came just decades after David Brainer, and it was read by Adoniram Judson, who I shared his story. Um, he would also, decades later, travel around the world with Brainerd's biography in tow and do the same thing as David Brainerd, but in far-off places. Millions today can trace back their spiritual history to men and women who were deeply moved by the witness of David Brainerd. Was his a waste of life? was his a waste of good health. He could have lived longer. He could have faced better odds. He did not spent all those cold nights, rainy travels out on the mission field. No, it's not a tragedy. It's what we're here for. We live. We courageously witness. And we die. If you do those three things, 
live, courageously witness, and die, then you've lived a full life, even if you die at the age of 29. None of us will cheat death. Many of us will cheat our mission. It's meant to be done with courage. You need the Holy Spirit for a reason. It's meant to be done with the name of Jesus. Use it. It's meant to be combined with a real work of God in our lives that we share with others. Let's do it together. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you might give us the eyes to see our opportunities. Lord, give us the hearts to care for the lost. Lord, give us the courage to step out in faith. And Lord, give us the mouths to be willing to speak. Lord, it's your name. It's your purposes. What are we here for? What are we here for? We're here for you. I pray that we might accept our mission. For your glory, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go outside and sing. church in response to all these things let's sing
Amen. We miss you guys. Hope to see you real soon. Have a great week. God bless you.